Officials do say the warhead will be taken apart at a plant near Amarillo, Texas. We don't know where it is right now. On the containers, there was the signature, do not drop. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning now. Okay, as we have an apparent serious oxygen leak. Four, three, two. Hello, listener, and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, he, him, Chris, he, him, KD, he, him, and a cozy Chris, he, him. And today we're going to talk about the Damascus incident, or that time the U.S. Air Force turned a nuclear warhead into a champagne cork. <laughs> promising, already promising. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited for this one. The atomic spud gun. So, today's guest, War Takes, or Komodo Dad KD, is a military blogger and all-around knower of things soldier and military industrial complex. He has volunteered his time to come talk to us and at you. Is this generosity going to be paid back? No. Because we're going to talk about an incredibly dumb moment in rocket history. KD, thank you so much for coming on this very dumb show. You're very welcome. Actually, you know what? Initially, I was a little confused you you asked me on because I assumed this was about the poorly received uh, 2006 Matthew McConaughey film, Failure to Launch. <laughs> but now that you explain a little bit more, I, I, I think I, I was already willing to come out of the box uh, on this, but now I'm more invested. So let's do this thing. We are trying to get them delisted, tragically. We're, we're the top Failure to Launch podcast now. And yeah, getting that movie, getting Matt gone is going to be, uh, that, that's the current ceiling on our, our fame. This is your version of, of Joe Kasabian's fight with the British <laughs> led by donkeys people, but you'll win in the end. Him, him uh, complaining about how a bunch of like weird British Tories now think that he um, set up like a lettuce uh, banner behind Liz Truss <laughs> after led by donkeys latest stunt. Wait, what? Oh, that, that explains everything. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I it, saw it, that image. All, it, I saw. I, I think they posted that on Twitter, and I'm like, "Wow, did they really do that? That rules." <laughs> yeah, and and it's an entirely separate group from lines led by donkeys. You know, it's a strange and wonderful place. I yeah, <laughs> copyright law. I'm not entirely a fan of it until someone stole the name for my podcast twelve years before I thought of it. <laughs> Now, have any of you guys ever heard of the Damascus incident? And I'll preface this by saying Damascus, Arkansas. No, actually. I did not know there was a Damascus, Arkansas, no. Me neither. The fact neither. that there is a Damascus, Arkansas does not surprise me, given some of the other names, but I'm not familiar with the Damascus incident. I have already heard about this one, and I am so excited. So, on the night of September 19th, 1980, or I guess it was September 18th to 19th, 1980, a U.S. Air Force Titan II ballistic missile detonated in its silo in the middle of rural Arkansas. But it's going to be a bit of a roundabout process to explain how a missile that could and did launch manned spacecraft into orbit wound up buried in a hole in the middle of nowhere with a 9 megaton atomic warhead. Also, listener, if this is something you enjoy and you want to hear more of it, uh, you can find us on Patreon. Uh, subscribing at any tier gets you access to monthly bonus episodes and... Uh, subscribing at elevated tiers gets you access to more bonus content. Also, as we get into this, the main sources I am going to be relying on for this episode are the books Command and Conquer, or Command and Control by Eric Schlosser, and Titan 2 by David Stump. As always, sources will be linked down below in the show notes. I have to, I have to jump on that one. Mr. Stump? I, I bit my tongue, but I'm going to let you go. <laughs> you called it Command and Conquer, and I mean, like, yeah, I, I remember that. I remember this happening. Yeah, the Red, Alert 2, the Red <laughs> Alert 2 opening cinematic when Yuri mind controls the guy in the nuclear missile silo, and they don't exactly. open the silo doors. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. 
I was having that exact thought, not because the book name got me there, but because I was watching a speed run like a week ago. It's going to be a news report about this on the TV, and then <laughs> Kane's going to turn around in his chair and say, you can't kill the Messiah. Oh, no. Welcome back, Commander. <laughs> if Kane were here, would we be so back, or would it be Jover? Oh, I Jover think it'd be beyond... somewhere on there. I think it'd be the chart, you know, the, the, the chart of going up and down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a cyborg. I, d I don't want to join any of the more culty elements of the Hand of Nod. I thought those were like your favorite parts. Aesthetically, maybe. I would not want to be part of them. All right, so here's here's because like the, the like the hand of nod goes from like anarchist having fun militia to 40k. It, it so, spans that entire thing, and I I know where I would prefer to sit on that spectrum. So segueing from that, before we go right back on topic, uh, what is the statistical likelihood you that you think that you would end up living in a yellow zone? Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure the map in those games is just like first world, second world, third world. Um, they're not yeah, they're the not supremely part. subtle about it. All I know is that they have to put Las Vegas in like the blue zone or whatever because that's where like they they were headquartered. Yeah, Westwood their offices. <laughs> All I know is like I'm afraid I'd have to be lame and work for GDI if only then I could work for General you know James Earl Jones and then later General oh, yeah. you know Michael Ironside. <laughs> I'm just saying like, would you be friends with mutants? I'd like to think I would be. I'd like to think I have an open mind. Which faction is more friends with mutants? I actually don't know. Anyway, you want to tell us about a missile? Oh fuck. See, the guest is keeping me on track, guys. This is supposed to be your Failure job. To launch the, the Command and Conquer podcast. I'd start a Command and Conquer podcast. I mean, we did talk about a Call of Duty Black Ops mission. It'll be bonus content somewhere down the line. I'm sure we can justify some space Okay, you can stuff. have me back on for that one. Oh, absolutely. U.S. ballistic missiles. Now, our story, like a lot of FTL stories, starts on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union achieved a major scientific and military breakthrough by launching the world's first satellite into orbit using the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. While Sputnik 1 was a science dud that didn't do anything more than beep, a far cry from our beloved Object D orbiting laboratory, uh, which should have flown first, it did clearly send a message to the Soviet's enemies. If we can put a satellite in orbit, we can drop a nuke on you. The screaming ball was the herald of things to come. Yes. And with the aid of American politicians and media, this message was amplified into the Sputnik panic. Now, we've covered the panic in detail a couple of times on this show. If you want to learn more about it, I'd recommend the Project Vanguard series and the episode about Operation Argus. So for today, I'm just going to be focusing on the military aspect of the Sputnik panic. Now, even if the Soviets were the first to deploy ICBMs with the R-7, or Semyorka, which just means seven, uh, they were still completely outgunned by the U.S. and Strategic Air Command, led by certified lunatic Curtis LeMay. But in the aftermath of Sputnik, that reality did not matter. The Soviets had rockets, so America needed rockets. Add in the fact that every military branch wanted to own these cool new toys, and procurement became a shit show. Yeah, no, the, the late 50s, like, I mean, between probably one of the worst periods in the Cold War for procurement was was the 1950s, be it Eisenhower and massive retaliation and basically all the military services going. The only way we can get money is if everything we do is nukes and everything is nukes for a while. And it basically took like two decades after that for the military to unfuck itself from that. And we're going to talk about that nature kind of heals like natural selection kind of happens for these rockets. Quote. The inter-service rivalry over missiles was exacerbated by the competition among the defense contractors hoping to build them. The General Dynamics Corporation lobbied aggressively for Atlas, the Martin Company for Titan, Boeing for Minuteman, Douglas Aircraft for Thor, Chrysler for Jupiter, and Lockheed for Polaris. President Eisenhower planned to fund two or three of these missile programs and cancel the rest, based on their merits and the nation's strategic needs. Amid democratic accusations of a missile gap, Eisenhower agreed to fund all six. Which is also just the ancient wisdom of never publicly beat America at a thing. Never say that you have hypersonic missiles and they don't, because they will just panic and open the money uh, sluice. And I cannot stress to listeners enough how much there really was not a missile gap. No, like there, there was a huge. It was a huge point of the 1960 presidential election. It was just not true. Like the, the Soviets had like a dozen or two ICBMs that could hit America. We we fucking outgunned them in every possible way. It was mm -hmm. a complete, like, political invention. And before that, there was the bomber gap, where the Soviets oh, 
again, like I, I always go back and forth between like whether they actually tricked America into thinking they had more bombers and more rockets. Um, like they definitely played that way to their propaganda. Uh, Khrushchev famously said, these missiles will roll out of our factories like sausages and then proceeded to make 10 of them. But at the same time, like I, I honestly think a lot of the U.S. government and um, like military and military industrial complex were just like, hey, if we pretend to believe this, we can get more money. Yeah, a little column A, a little column B. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the U.S. has been panicked into spending billions on funding literally every single rocket program. No idea is too stupid. And for those who don't know, this is not how weapons procurement normally goes. For all of the corruption inherent in those processes, they don't just slap every design into service and see how it pans out. Because in this case, it did not pan out. Yeah, nowadays what we do is we spend a bunch of money developing something for like about a decade and a half, it doesn't work, and then we cancel it. Hell yeah. The Canadian method is to just have like the whoever joins the competition then sues each other for 20 years, which is why that like why Canada has only just now stopped using Browning pistols. Or planned to stop. I thought using the Canadian them. approach was to have your aerospace industry be destroyed because we didn't want you to have one. <laughs> In complete fairness, everyone, the Avro Aero story that we'll get to is it's not entirely. Uh, I think it, there's a lot of self inflicted wound in there as well, as uh, like American pressure was certainly a part of it. Yeah. And also just the fact that Canada allowed the industry to die and be entirely exported. But once operational ballistic missiles started being fielded in 1958, the Air Force, who were the ones who kind of wound up winning the ownership of ICBMs, except for Polaris submarine missiles, they had an eclectic mix of half-baked designs, each of them very rushed and finicky. My favorite of these was the SM-62 Snark. Oh boy. A nuclear-armed intercontinental cruise missile, basically a mega tomahawk. Oh my god. Oh my god. I love, I love, you can really see uh, the size of this thing when you look at it compared to the, the like, deuce and a half or the six ton behind, yeah. below it. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah. god. This thing is the size, like, I thought initially, oh, this is the size of a cruise missile. No, this is the size of a bomber. This is massive. It has drop tanks. Yes. And this is part of the reason why the Air Force initially, before they came up with missile designations, they called a lot of missiles by B bomber designations, and they were about <laughs> the size of them. Part of that was actually political as well, because the um, whenever every different force was arguing why they should own missiles, the army's argument was this is self-propelled artillery. This is a shell that has an engine on it. Whereas the Air Force argued it's an unmanned bomber. We should get it. Inter-service rivalry. We love it. So the idea was that it could be launched from bases in the U.S. and fly all the way to Soviet targets to deliver a three metric ton warhead. This sounds good on paper, but the execution was something else. As designed, the Snark had an accuracy of about 1.5 miles or 2.5 kilometers. In testing, no missile made it within 30 kilometers of a target. That is one hell of a CEP. <laughs> hell yeah. I love that I was going to make snarky comments before you even segue to this about but how I'm Tish. My... Oh, crap. <laughs> I walked right <laughs> into that. Yeah, I was going to make some snide comments about how, like, man, I hope that's a guided munition. Raytheon? Raytheon? <laughs> Wake up, dear. <laughs> so, one test snark that was launched from Florida, it was meant to fly around Puerto Rico and then come back to, like, test its guidance system. Instead, it just went rogue and flew off towards South America. This is the second time on this podcast that South America was narrowly uh, baked alive by the <laughs> spicy rockets, so... It just really wanted to go to Rio. The rocket wants to go on vacation. Just let it. Hold that thought, because the wreckage was found in Brazil two decades later. They didn't, they didn't try and find it, it just disappeared. <laughs> and then it was some just doing, it was doing, Look, it was doing a special episode, like Smiling Friends. <laughs> the Air Force just threw a, what could have potentially been a thermonuclear bottle rocket in Brazil, just said, oh shit, uh. Yeah, I, I'm just like, hey, where's the test rocket? Uh. What test rocket? <laughs> Status, unk. <laughs> And despite this, inertia kept the Snark program going until it was accepted in 1959. It then served two years and was pulled from service in 1961. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that in the late 50s and early 60s. Missiles, planes, things, things that are introduced and like withdrawn from service after less than a decade. Because, I mean, things were just moving so fast, advancements were moving so fast, like we kind of plateaued eventually in military development and now... 
kind big of advancements kind of come fewer and farther between now we and and also just like cost savings the money sluice not being there anymore f16s mod 12 mark b rev 42 or something yeah but they also do still work i mean look it was perfect you can't make it better okay that's that's not to say they don't work and in this episode we're going to talk about the kind of dichotomy because america is still like one of these missiles that is introduced in the 60s is the minuteman and america is still using the minuteman 3 not for lack of trying to replace it yes. it's running into some yeah. difficulties <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> For all of the shit show in the U.S., missiles stationed um, near the Soviet Union were not much better. For example, the Jupiter missiles stationed in Turkey, and these were the inspiration for the Soviets to put missiles in Cuba, which started the Cuban Missile Crisis. These missiles are not good. Well, yeah, they were made by Chrysler. (laughs) Unlike later silo-based missiles, the Jupiter spent its entire life sitting vertical, outdoors, on its launch pad. If it ever needed to fire... It'd need 15 minutes to fuel on launch, during which time it was like someone could just strafe the thing. Someone could shoot it. Just just poke a hole. Honestly, yes. The same was true of the Thor missiles stationed in the UK. Some British strategists argued even that the missiles actually put Britain more at risk, since if the Soviets wanted to start a war, they would have to atomic bomb the UK to prevent these missiles getting off the ground. And nothing of value was lost. (laughs) Sorry to all my UK friends and also boyfriend. <laughs> I, I have a feeling a lot of them would agree with you. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, I feel they like they would. would all agree with you. Like, <laughs> Okay, the crucially, crucially, and nothing of value was lost, assuming that everyone there I actually cared about was evacuated ahead of time. Mm, mm, fair, fair. Um, <laughs> America just pulling the Thor. I'm sorry, little one, to Britain. Watching TU-95s <laughs> fly overhead towards America and just holding up signs like, us next, please. <laughs> now, the Thor and Jupiter were both scrapped in 1963 as the new Atlas ICBM started coming online. And then the Atlas was pulled from service in 1965. Rip. Yeah, on, on track. On yeah, track, yeah. yes. Also, the Atlas being the missile um, that launched the first American astronauts into orbit. They had earlier done suborbital flights on, like, Redstone rockets. But, uh, yeah, continuing the tradition of ICBMs. This, I think, was the other way. The R-7 was a, uh, a satellite launcher that was kind of converted into a, a rocket. This was an ICBM that failed and was then used for space stuff, thankfully, which is the proper way things should go. Just shitty enough at its job, it got reassigned. <laughs> it can go up. This is what happens when you have something designed by a Belgian. <laughs> Just... <laughs> uh, k- k- uh, Carol, Bo- Bosart joke for the real heads. Okay. <laughs> Racking my brains trying to, like... Wait a second, Korolev, Belgian Korolev. Yeah, I was talking about for the Atlas. I think like a lot. Yeah, not 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 all of our rockets were designed by Nazis. Some of them were designed by entirely different weird <laughs> Europeans who came over separate from that. Now, long story short, in their panic to match the Soviets, America threw everything at the wall, and most of it did not stick. What did, at least for land-based ICBMs, was a pair of programs. The first was Minuteman a small, cheap design that used solid-fuel rockets and could be safely stored underground for decades and launched with practically no preparation. It was great. Everything the Air Force needed. Except it was tiny, and thus the warhead it could carry was small, much smaller than the 5,500-kilo behemoth that the Soviet R-7 could throw. To match them, America would need a massive new missile with a huge throw weight, the, the kind of technical term for, like, how big of a payload it can actually throw at the Soviets. And this would be Titan. And lest it seem like I'm setting this up as some triumphant reveal, this also did not go well, and the Titan missile was a deeply flawed design from the beginning. Uh, The first variant, Titan 1, worked like this. Quote, The missile would be filled with propellants underground about 15 minutes before launch, and then would ride an elevator to the surface before ignition. The elevator was immense, capable of lifting more than half a million pounds, but it didn't always work. During a test run of the first Titan silo, overlooking the Pacific at Vandenberg, a control valve in the elevator's hydraulic system broke. The elevator, the Titan, and about 170,000 pounds of liquid oxygen and fuel fell all the way to the bottom of the silo. Um, And this is not part of the quote, but they did indeed detonate. It's suboptimal. (laughs) There are many things that I can imagine being terrifying, and watching a missile, any, any like rocket crash footage where you see a missile go up and then fall back down... Missiles going down is always a bad sign, no matter what you're doing. (laughs) Even more accurately, going down faster than they went up. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> they just watch the world's worst prairie dog in action. <laughs> God. It's also worth mentioning that the exact same thing was being mirrored in the Soviet Union. Sergei Korolev, our hero, had been really effective in duping Kremlin politicians and military leaders into thinking that the R-7 would be a super weapon. It wasn't. It was a satellite launcher first and a crappy ICBM second. Even the worst American ICBMs theoretically could be fueled and launched in 15 minutes. The R-7 would take hours, if not days. Look, if you want a job done right, you gotta take your time. There is actually good God, footage is... of, like, as Sputnik 1 is being prepared for launch, all of these bigwig officials have been brought out, and the military guys are all nervous because they're like, hey, I thought this was gonna be, like, ready to launch quickly. Like, all of them are watching this huge historic scientific moment, and then in the back of their head is the realization that, like, if we ever have to use this thing as a weapon, if the Americans attack us, this thing cannot get off the ground. <laughs> Unless the, its only use was as a first strike weapon, and it wasn't even that good at that, uh, because the accuracy was horrible. Its follow-up was even funnier, though. Like the Americans, the Soviets scrambled to build new silo-based missiles that could be protected and launched quickly. Like the Americans, they also ran into problems. Like when a prototype R-16 ballistic missile famously exploded in Baikonur, killing upwards of 60 people, including Marshal of Artillery Nadellin, who it, this scene is now named after. The Soviets just love killing their own high-ranking officers. They just can't help In it. In complete fairness, this is like, it's mostly Nadellin's fault, so I'm happy he died. Uh, but this also, like, <laughs> this also killed a solid chunk of the Soviet space program. <laughs> this, this is obviously the point of divergence for, for, uh, for all mankind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one timeline where now Nadellin doesn't get smoked in a lawn chair. No, the, 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 point, the point of divergence for all mankind is that Korolev doesn't die of hemorrhoid surgery. And that is actually true. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that is actually. In our world, Sea Dragon actually launched. In our world, they just pulled out the hemorrhoids and then they just kind of kept pulling and like all the internal organs just kind of came with it. <laughs> a ripcord for to destroy Korolev. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for all mankind, it's a great show as long as you just fast forward through all like the badly written relationship drama. Oh, yeah. I absolutely love it for like the, the speculative fiction and um, kind of a what if the Soviets had gotten there first that doesn't just turn into like Iron Sky, but Soviet. Exactly. Doesn't just get Wolfensteined on you. Yeah. <laughs> I love that like the Soviet like upper echelons are all equally disposable because they're just regular people with an executive title slapped onto the front. Yeah, like there's plenty more Nadellans to just replace him. Just decant another one from the pod. Now. By the mid to late 60s, the American ballistic missile fleet had mostly stabilized to a handful of more mature designs. With more than a thousand deployed, Minutemen missiles formed the bulk of America's nuclear strike power. The Titan I design was scrapped and replaced with the upgraded Titan II that had double the payload capacity, was more accurate, and critically, it used storable fuels that meant it could be fired immediately and from inside its silos. No elevator, no 15 minutes for fueling, just light it and it's off. And it's more efficient, but seeing it come up in the elevator, you know, you crucially miss, you, you lose the cool factor, exactly. but I get then it. You can't menace someone with a silo. Are you, just, just sit there having it go up and down. <laughs> well, that's why you gotta be like, you gotta be doing the, like, sitting somewhere in a control center like Blofeld oh, with your hands sort of tented, you know, or like stroking a cat, watching it slowly rise up from the below ground. That would have been so cool because all of these silos are just like surrounded by farms. If you had done the Khrushchev thing where he's going and he's looking at corn and he's just having the time of his life, and then you intimidate just him by just having rising. missiles missiles slowly rising on the horizon like a full circle around him meanwhile the other side of the cornfield is that meme with the cat and the overalls going what they doing over there <laughs> <laughs> you may be wondering what kind of storable fuels the titan II used because they weren't solid fuel they were liquid the oxidizer was dinitrogen tetroxide and the fuel was aerosine 50 which was a 50 50 mix of hydrazine and our favorite unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. So they took hydrazine and they cut it with worse hydrazine. Beautiful. For the uninitiated, these fuels are what we would call fun. They are hypergolic. They will melt you, give you cancer, poison you, asphyxiate you, light you on fire, all at the same time. They are not, these are, these are horrific chemicals that are pretty good for rocket fuel, it turns out. Horrifying, but interesting. When, when people talk about how they're putting chemicals in food, that's what they're talking about, by the way. 
<laughs> this will this will turn the frogs gay and then melt them shortly after. But for that one second that they are gay and still alive, those frogs, man. <laughs> one moment of bliss of realization and then you're just gone into soup. I had a very useless realization that America as a country was founded and defended by the Minute Man. <laughs> and now America is defended by the Minute Man, the apex of weaponry that is simultaneously falling apart, I'm told. Am I inferring that correctly? A little bit. But they're solid fuel, so at least We're they're not melting We're back to defending people. ourselves against the Redcoats, but this time the Redcoats are just, the you reds. Know, communists. The Reds. With the Minute Man. It's all beautiful symmetry. And uh, Russia, I, I'm pretty sure it's a NATO reporting name, but they've folded it into their propaganda, naming their new missiles like Satan. Oh no, that was, a, that was I think, a NATO or US designation. But, like, I know Dmitry Rogozin, at the very least, was like, hell yeah, we got the Satan missiles, everyone. Yeah! Man, we gotta talk about Rogo sometime. Watching the Satan ICBM lift off while doing, like, the devil horn hands. The problem is I hear Satan and I think Mr. Satan from Dragon Ball Z. And it's just, the intimidation is completely gone. Now, the Titan II officially became operational in 1963, and Strategic Air Command maintained a total of 54 missiles. Uh, so there were three bases that had these squadrons, and each of those squadrons had 18 silos kind of parceled out. They were in a kind of radius around each um, base. So these were in Arizona, Arkansas, and Kansas. Arkansas is kind of a one I did. Like, you know, you hear about all the missile fields in the heartland. You don't really think about missile fields in Arkansas. You think of like Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, all those places. You don't think about Arkansas for missiles that much. Well, a lot of it is actually just because of proximity. Um, like those kind of fields are Minuteman bases because they right. don't require nearly as much um, maintenance. Like you can just leave. For, for example, a Minuteman silo is just a silo. The command center can be miles away. Right. These ones, they need much more maintenance. They need people actively on hand 24-7. And that means they have to be very close to Air Force bases. So with Arkansas, that's because of Little Rock being right there. That makes sense. So it's it's a more of a necessity thing. Also, yeah, not great for security because Air, like Little Rock would be a target anyway. And all of these silos are kind of in the blast range compared to Minuteman silos that can just be like hidden wherever. I grossly Oops. misinterpreted that statement of Oh, so what you're saying is rednecks are going to come in and steal rocket parts from the base? <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, American Heartland Baikonur. Coming in to take the rocket fuel, turn it into moonshine. <laughs> the moonshine that kills you instantly. <laughs> the moonshine that disintegrates you. It melts through the bottom of the stills, but it fucks you up while it's in there. Nuclear weapon disaster. Now, another topic we need to cover is nuclear weapon disasters and how to mitigate them. See, in the Cold War, the Americans and Soviets were both committed to mutually assured destruction as a strategy, but they were also committed to finding ways to cheat MAD. So mutually assured destruction is the idea that if you have enough nuclear weapons, no one will fuck with you because they know that you will shoot them back. Basically, to start a nuclear conflict is suicide by definition under mutually assured destruction. Peace through strength, whatever kind of... Yeah, and the key, and the key there is, is having a deterrent that's survivable. It's yes. creating the doubt in the mind of your enemy that they, can, they, they, that they are capable of wiping out all of your nuclear weapons in a first go by, by making your weapons more survivable, harder to find a target, so you will always be able to fire off enough to destroy them if they destroy you. Mm -hmm. And critically, both sides thought they could cheat MAD. Both sides, like, they wanted to maintain it for themselves, but whenever it came to the enemy, they wanted to find a way to kill the enemy before they could shoot back. So the way to do this is either to have better weapons or just build a fuck ton more of them. So all through the 50s, 60s, 70s, both sides were in a race to build as many warheads as possible and deploy dozens of different delivery mechanisms. Naturally, when you have thousands of nukes scattered all around the world and mounted to very complicated machinery, Accidents are going to happen, human and otherwise. In the U.S. military, an event involving the accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss of a nuclear weapon is called a broken arrow. And so far, officially, there have been 32, though there are reports of significantly more. Because the U.S. nuclear force has always been heavily bomber-based, a lot of these involve bombs accidentally falling out of B-52s. Similarly, because the Soviets were very submarine-based with their missiles, there's a lot of their versions of Broken Arrows, which is just a submarine sank, and now a shitload of missiles are missing. 
While the Air Force would insist that its handling and safety procedures were enough to prevent any kind of nuclear disaster, the government knew that, statistically, they'd still happen, eventually. And the way they modeled this was both interesting and depressing. They viewed the accidental detonation of Air Force warheads on American soil as being an inevitable natural disaster, like an earthquake or a hurricane. Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can do to stop it. You can only mitigate it. That's such a that's such a statement of its time. Like I I, I can visualize. I don't even, I don't know if they wrote this, but I could just visualize the 1950s ass cover of the Rand Corporation <laughs> report that said this. Why a nuke will detonate and it will be okay. Yeah. If only there were a way to stop this pile of thousands of nukes from sometimes exploding. You really start to understand why Stanley Kubrick <laughs> titled the film "Why I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb," <laughs> and just and just coming to the conclusion that. Oh well, I guess it's I guess it's necessary. I guess it's just an, an it's natural that these bombs go off in the American heartland. The nuke just yearns to launch itself. <laughs> it yearns for the void. And like all jokes aside, I do kind of agree with this in the sense that like statistically, the book Command and Control makes a very good point, which is that nuclear weapons are machines and machines break. If you have thousands of them, statistically, accidents will happen. Even if they're really good, the best machines will still eventually break. Mm -hmm. And and what you can do then, it's it's depressing, but it does make sense that the U.S. government would come up with, you know, what are the probabilities? We can try and keep them low, but there is always a chance. So in 1957, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project put out their list of what they called acceptable probabilities. Quote, it proposed that the odds of a hydrogen bomb exploding accidentally from all causes while in storage during the entire life of the weapon should be 1 in 10 million. And the lifespan of a typical weapon was assumed to be 10 years. At first glance, these odds made the possibility of a nuclear disaster seem remote. But if the United States kept 10,000 hydrogen bombs in storage for 10 years, the odds of an accidental detonation became much higher, 1 in 1,000. And if those weapons were removed from storage and loaded onto airplanes, the study proposed some acceptable probabilities that the American public, had it been informed, might not have found so acceptable. The odds of a hydrogen bomb detonating by accident every decade would be 1 in 5. And during that same period, the odds of an atomic bomb detonating by accident in the United States would be about 100%. So th these are, this is the acceptable probability, by the way. <laughs> So were, the, were their numbers off, or did we just get really lucky? We just got lucky. We got unreasonably lucky. And really, it's kind of amazing that between us, the Soviets, the Chinese, whoever, that we have not had an accidental nuclear weapon detonation yeah. at all at this point in history. There definitely have been mishaps with planned detonations. Like, um, famously, there was a, um, a U.S. hydrogen bomb that they thought would be five megatons, and then it wound up being 15. Oops. Also, one fun bit is that these early studies ignored human error like they didn't even consider it, not because they didn't think it would happen, but because they thought it was too complicated to quantify. <laughs> Airmen can fuck up in statistically impossible ways, and we cannot work this into our model. How can the enlisted man be stupid enough? <laughs> the U like a 19 year old U.S. airman is a is like turbulence. It's like the Reynolds number. You can only estimate it. You cannot quantify it for how stupid it can be incredible don't peel back the veil you will be scared incredible movie but i can also guarantee you that um <laughs> that stanley kubrick's movie has led to a bunch of nuclear accidents explicitly because of airmen trying to rodeo the nuke a hundred percent this is a non-zero yeah non, -z like non -zero it has happened and maybe the like a lot of the accidents that don't qualify as broken arrows is like a guy ran over his foot with the nuke trolley <laughs> There have been more than a few where, like, the guy is just pushing around the trolley and it hits the wall and then the nuke in its casing kind of, like, shifts forward and hits the wall a little bit. Broken arrow! You still have to count that. <laughs> but, like, yeah. at the same time, if I'm pushing that trolley and I hear that thunk, I'm, like, I'm immediately going to church. Because <laughs> God was obviously looking out for you. I feel like there's two reactions to that. One is the guy who immediately goes to church the next day. The one who hears the thunk and goes, like, ah, oh, well, my, my, like, Rest of my day is completely ruined. <laughs> There's going to be paperwork. I love the idea that, that, like, you know, like somewhere a monkey's paw curls, right? Like, the force of nature that determines that the accidents have to continue to occur at the rate they were calculated means that, like, 
there is a malevolent universal force that makes sure that technicalities happen that make them count towards the statistics. So this like, is the a, void like dragon. you said, the guy's foot getting run over by like the a trolley or something like the it wasn't directly the missile, but it's related to the handling of the missile. Thus, there's an accident. Which of the 40k chaos gods would this be? Would this be? This is just the 40k void dragon. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> this is just the thing that makes machine work all the way down to a light switch. Maybe the reason we haven't had a disaster yet is we've just been really properly beseeching the machine spirits. Um, this actually segues well because I was imagining like surrounding a nuke in candles. And another <laughs> risk of a nuclear accident is a warhead being put in what they called an abnormal environment. And by abnormal environment, they mean being lit on fucking fire. I would say that's abnormal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Now, my favorite part of this is that they assigned every American nuclear warhead a time factor. Because basically, if you light something on fire, like theoretically, there's not a one-to-one -one it's going to cause the atomic bomb to detonate. However, there are all kinds of possibilities, like the fact that, say there's a circuit board that controls the firing, you melt all of the solder, you are now putting all kinds of fun new circuits into this circuit board, and maybe they'll cause an explosion. So every single American warhead was given a time factor, which is the amount of time you had after a warhead was engulfed in flames to either A, extinguish the fire, or B, get a thousand feet away. And I don't think a thousand feet away is going to cut it, honestly. No. Like, Davy Crockett, that would not save you from the tiniest nuke imaginable. Well, I guess there's also then the factor of whether or not, like, I'm sure, like, basically, like, the, the high explosive material yeah. might explode, but it might not necessarily go fissile. Yeah, that is also fair. And nukes of the time and I guess now today also being just full of plastic explosives. I mean, it's just, it's just a good thing that they didn't paint the warheads red because, you know, we all know what happens with the barrels. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, to have all of the uh, lensed explosives go off correctly is just vanishingly impossible, but still always possible, especially when your firing circuit starts you know, kind of doing some freeform jazz with how it's forming connections. Yeah, watching the firing circuit just do, like, the Terminator 2, like, reforming all of the solder, just forming a puddle and moving explicitly towards the firing circuit. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's like, yeah, even if it doesn't go fully, like, just doesn't fully detonate, you know, it's like, oh boy, it's, I no longer have a nuke, I just have a dirty bomb. <laughs> I was just say, you are dispersing a lot of material pretty far away. <laughs> Shittiest confetti cannon in history. The idea that a nuclear missile is just the world's largest fragmentation bomb. I mean, you know what? You, I mean, like, you could just. I, there's nothing saying you couldn't just make a conventional ICBM and just put a big frag warhead on it. You could do that. Just no one's done it yet. So all of these concerns mean that there is a push in designing nuclear weapons towards making them more safe. But at the same time, there is also push back. Quote. A safety mechanism that made a bomb less likely to explode during an accident could also, during wartime, render it more likely to be a dud. So, <laughs> so they've just got this like, this like, hey, uh, people are the designers are trying to make them safe and trying to prevent accidents, and the Air Force is continually just like, why no, make make it explode bigger and easier. It's always this back and forth between safety and effectiveness with weapons. You want it to be safe towards the user, and you want it to be dangerous towards whoever it's pointed at. And this was best summed up. In the design philosophy, like the Air Force came down to a design philosophy to give to the weapon designers. They were like, hey, how safe, like, w where do we want to draw the line on this? You tell us and we'll design to it. And the Air Force came up with always slash never. Their advice was an American nuclear weapon should always explode when it's supposed to and never when it's not. Thank you, Air Force. Very helpful. What a succinct <laughs> and sagely piece of advice. Beautiful. Thank you, Curtis Lee LeMay. You are incredibly helpful. I hope your 1968 <laughs> presidential campaign with George Wallace goes very well. <laughs> now, needless to say, we are because this did not work and we're going to talk about some nuclear disasters. And like we talked about before, we have gotten just in the last 70 years or so, so lucky. We have gotten so lucky that things aren't worse. For example, in 1961, a USAF B-52 bomber broke up in midair over Goldsboro, North Carolina. The bomber was carrying two four-megaton atomic warheads. And by freak chance, as the fuselage broke up, the aerodynamic forces pulled the arming and, like, they pulled the lanyards in the cockpit that deployed the bombs. Not just, like, the fuselage broke apart and the bombs fell free, the pins were pulled. They were armed and deployed. I knew that one. Yeah. I, did, I, I knew about that incident. I didn't realize just 
how bad it was. As far as the bombs were concerned, they had been dropped on an enemy. Everything was going according to plan. Thankfully, one of them slammed into the ground before its systems could fully arm it. The other went through every step necessary to detonate. When it hit the ground, the nose cone smushed, the firing circuit was completed, and it sent a pulse that should have turned a good chunk of North Carolina into a crater. The only reason that it didn't was a single manual safety switch, and the designers of the weapon later noted that that safety switch often did not work. (laughs) So there is just a light switch on the side of the weapon. Oh, here's your problem. You set the switch to not blow up. There's your problem. I guess good thing they weren't set to fucking air burst. Disciplining the pilot for having the safeties set to on. That is the... You did prevent a nuclear disaster, but but we are going to have to write you up for this regardless because you didn't actually follow procedure. That is the most cucked fusion weapon in history. Just, yeah, I get to (laughs) fucking explode. Yeah. The other one, the other one is more fun because it hit the ground and just like the second one, it's parachute deployed. It was found caught in a tree. What? Kind of caught like the nose cone had hit the ground, but the parachute was in a tree. The other one buried itself into the ground and a bunch of dudes like before knowing if the case had been broken and if there was radioactive contamination, they had to dig it out by hand. So you've just been asked to dig for a nuclear weapon, and you probably don't know this at the time, but that nuclear weapon has been armed. It thinks it is landing in the Soviet Union. Someone's going to smack that switch by accident and just white light all around. You joke, but had that happened, like after it had been fired, if that switch were flipped, if anyone on the recovery team had flipped that switch, the circuit would have gone through and it would have detonated instantly. Thinking about the multiverse of different ways in which that switch was accidentally flipped by someone and we live in like one of like the five where it just wasn't. Like some some squirrel just accidentally happens by in the tree (laughs) and like through some force of fate, it steps on and pushes the switch. I also just love the idea as like an anti-dud mechanism that if the bomb lands in the Soviet Union, it can still be detonated if someone stupid enough just comes up and flips the switch. Or just like what deploy, is deploying do? a CIA guy to like, hey, there's a bomb in the middle of Red Square. You need to go hit a button on it and then you'll come home and get a parade. Or just someone just flips it because the intrusive thoughts win. <laughs> just 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 thinking about one of those multiverses where like one of the, the, the airmen who shows up to like after this bomb drops is just Peter Griffin. And it's just that scene, <laughs> like, dude, you know, from Family Guy where he just opens the emergency door on the plane. <laughs> It's in, instead of like a little switch under a safety latch, it's just a huge like it's the staples that was easy button with do not press on it. <laughs> hey, Lois, things could always be worse. Remember that time I was in the Air Force? <laughs> Smash cut to North Carolina, like exploding. And he's just staring at the switch. <laughs> the Damascus incident. Now, all of that brings us up to 1980. After 17 years of service, and despite being more than a decade obsolete, the Titan II was still an active and critical part of America's ICBM arsenal. Unlike the Minuteman missiles that had been steadily upgraded over the years, the Titan was exactly the same missile and hardware that had gone on permanent 24-hour alert in 1963. If you are wondering how that could happen when the US was not shy about spending billions on weapons, there are a couple of reasons. The first is that while the Pentagon wanted the Titan II gone as early as 1970, the Air Force didn't want to give them up. While the 54 Titan missiles represented only like 5% of America's land-based missiles, they were also more than a third of the total megatonnage America could launch. So that's like air-launched, ground-launched submarine. Yeah, and this is before MIRVs were a thing. These are the only heavyweight missiles that America has. Otherwise, they're relying on like tiny Polaris and Minuteman missiles. Getting rid of them would be a huge gap in the American nuclear capability. Every year, the Pentagon tried to decommission the Titan IIs, and every year, the Air Force would argue for a stay of execution, at least until a replacement design could be fielded, which it never was. And because of that, like, this process of wanting to get rid of the Titan IIs starts in the early 70s, and it keeps going for another, like, 20 years. And this is basically like the like shoe on the other foot. This is like the Air Force with the A-10 and basically Congress keeping them from retiring it like for years and years <laughs> and years, basically because of the Maryland congressional delegation. 
Do, like, are they made in Maryland? I actually wasn't. Uh, I, I, they, I think like a big chunk of the Maryland National Guard, at least for, for a while, I don't know if they are now, was was A-10 units. Like basically the big the big push from Congress was a lot of it was like a lot of A-10 units or National Guard units. And also, you know, they, you know, yeah. there, there was a yeah. lot of reasons, but mainly Congress is the one that's kept the A-10 in service for so long. Fun. <laughs> Man, karma. Not, not as fun when it karma happens bitch, to you. Air Force. Now, that is one reason. The other reason comes down to politics and a main character of the Cold War. Quote, Henry Kissinger had tried to get rid of the Titan Ooh, too. I, I, I had there to stop myself from punching my desk just now after <laughs> hearing that name. He considered the missile, quote, inaccurate and unreliable. It was a weapon system, he later explained, which the Pentagon had been wanting to scrap for years, and I kept in service for trading purposes. In 1972, while serving as the National Security Advisor for President Nixon, Kissinger had offered a deal to the Soviet Union. The United States would decommission its Titan II missiles if the Soviets agreed to retire their SS-9 missiles. So this did not work, and perpetually... Kissinger kept this obsolete weapon in like in service only for the purpose of dem like demonstratively decommissioning it. Thinking about him trying to get rid of it and just thinking that the heartbreaking worst person you know makes a great point. This, this is like going to like Russia or China and saying like, hey, if you get rid of your current gen tanks, we'll get rid of our Shermans. It's a good deal, right? It, it didn't even work in 1972. And by like 1980, the Soviets would never agree to this. It's like, why, why would we get rid of that? Why would we get rid of our good missiles for your antiques? <laughs> I want to be clear. It said Henry Kissinger had tried to get rid of the Titan II. He hated them. He knew, he knew the problems. He knew that they were inaccurate and unreliable, but he kept them around purely to be trading tokens. Playing that four-dimensional chess, you know. This is why we have peace in the Middle East. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> The Titan II also hadn't been without accidents, and the nature of the rocket, its fuel, and everything being buried in a sealed container made those accidents particularly deadly. In 1965, a fire broke out in a silo that was being renovated, killing 53 construction workers. Jesus! The fuel and oxidizer tanks at Titan II facilities also leaked constantly. Sometimes, like one time this killed a couple of local cattle, another time an oxidizer plume leaked and killed two locals. Okay, killing a couple cows is kind of funny, but killing like 50 construction workers, that, that's, that, that's, that's some serious numbers. Jesus. Yeah, I remember that thing about the propellant being absolutely terrifying. In this case, that fire was smoke inhalation. Um, there was either, either um, someone accidentally cut through a hydraulic line and set off a fire, or there was a mechanical failure. The missile actually survived, and it comes up later in the story, like that exact missile. And you're getting killed by a missile, and the missile lives, and you don't. Exactly. I'm I'm continuing, continuing to see examples of like this concentrated universal malice occurring. Also, the fact that they don't like they don't maintain the missile, they don't check it, they just put it in another silo. Incredible. Yeah, just going into work one day and you see like the Hiroshima like person shaped smears on the side of the rocket you're guarding. I'm sure that's that. Fun. Don't worry about it. So. I know that was a lot of setup in history to get us to the scene of this accident, but I do think it's necessary to fully understand how a dangerous, obsolete missile wound up buried in Arkansas. And I also want to be clear with this, the warhead that it carries is a 9 megaton warhead. This is the largest warhead that the US has ever deployed operationally. It is like, they're the largest they've ever tested, I think was 25. But the largest they ever put on a weapon was this. Yeah, this is one fifth of the Sar Bomba, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like it's a fuck ton. This is like uh, arguably the largest, the most powerful deployed atomic weapon ever. Yeah, like after this, like all the mega touch tonnage comes from having multiple smaller warheads yeah. like on a missile. This is, but this is like probably like the single largest mega tonnage warhead we ever deployed. Yes, absolutely. We don't need independently guided vehicles. We'll just turn the entire area into a smear. <laughs> it was also kind of the strategy the snark went for of just like yeah you know if the radius is 30 miles who cares if we land in 30 miles it's in the ballpark you know you're fine that's just the, the difference of hitting russia then hitting another country by accident i guess they just made the assumption at that point like well east and west <laughs> germany who even knows the difference west germany another case of and nothing of value was lost <laughs> so that situation an obsolete missile carrying the U.S.'s biggest warhead being buried in Arkansas. That was the situation on September 18, 1980. At the missile site 
or as its crews called it, 4-7. This was part of the 308th Strategic Missile Squadron based out of Little Rock Air Force Base in Arkansas. Now, unlike Missile, uh, Missile Man, why the fuck did I write that into my script? It, lesser known cousin to, to Mega Man. The, the American hero, the, the American founding heroes they don't talk about as much, the Missile Men. <laughs> Unlike Minuteman silos, where the missile could be miles away from its command point, every Titan II site had its own command center, manned and on alert 24-7. Crews would walk down a central staircase, and then they could either go like they could go to the left, through a couple of blast doors to get to the silo, or they could go to the right and get to the command center. These are just supervillain layers. Like, like I've, I've, I've seen pictures of tit these Titan missile complex before, and every time I never get tired of seeing them. Like, you totally see where Valve got inspiration oh, yeah. for the Black Mesa research facility scene. That was just supposed to be, I'm fully convinced in my head now, Black Mesa is just a decommissioned Titan missile base. <laughs> I want to live in one of these. The Titan missile is what you see in a whole lot of video games. It's the ICBM, basically. <laughs> it's the ICBM. It is the American ICBM. I mean, part of that is admittedly because the Minuteman isn't all that intimidating, um, but like Fallout, like you like you said, Half-Life, this is the missile. The Minuteman's like effective, but like in a boring way. Like, yes, I will target your car with this missile as opposed to a <laughs> and like, big... Also, the Minuteman has the, those Zaz, like you said, like, oh, you can put a bunch of them in a silo field, you can have the command center miles away. This, you have a huge, like, fucking, like, 1960s supervillain complex. It has <laughs> character, damn it. Like you said, it is the lair. People are now, like, buying these old decommissioned silos and turning them into, like, either prepper paradises or just, like, hotels. I just, I'm just like, I, I'm not a prepper, but I would, I would fucking like just turn this into a house. Like, I, I, fuck that. Yeah, yeah, I would do that. That would fucking rock. <laughs> My leaky, cracked, 60 year old underground cement base. <laughs> Look, it's a labor of love. It's a fixer upper. And the black mold that's growing in J.K. Rowling's house. That black yeah. mold might actually be radioactive a little bit. Look, it's, it's about the spirit of the thing. So that afternoon, September 18th, the missile needed some maintenance. It needed the pressure checked in one of its oxidizer tanks, and the people to do that were the Propellant Transfer Systems Crews, or PTS. And I want you to remember PTS, because we're going to be talking about them a lot. These were the guys who did any work involving the Titan II's incredibly dangerous fuel, and they also got to do it in safety suits called Refcos that looked basically like space suits. Holy shit, yeah, I'm looking at them now. Oh yeah, it does look like a cosplay of a spacesuit. A lot of, lot, of, lot of weird shaped patches on those yeah. suits. <laughs> and there's just like holes that they had to patch up. We'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit, but these things were not oh, actually um, proof against the rocket fuel that they were designed to be proof against. I was to say, uh, are those holes from it wearing, or is that dude just incredibly clumsy and he's just been poking holes by accident? <laughs> so yeah, these are the Rocket Fuel Handler's Clothing Outfit, which is a dumb name, but everyone just called them Refcos. On the 18th, the PTS guys arrived in the afternoon, but because of a miscommunication, they didn't get orders to start work until like well past six in the evening. This particular crew had also been on duty for all day. Like they were already like 14 hours into their shift whenever they were being asked to go fix this rocket. Ooh, are we going to start taking bingo boxes? It's a disaster. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. overworked crew, check. Orders coming late, check. Let's keep going. Yeah, in addition to being tired, they're probably annoyed. They had to sit around for hours, and then when they were probably ready to go, got told to start work. Check number three. So they're probably pissed off and annoyed. <laughs> Check number four. So as they were about to enter the silo, so they make it in, they go through all the blast doors. One of the technicians realized that he'd forgotten a torque wrench back in the truck. This was a new addition to the checklist. This was not something they were used to. It was not something they were trained with. It had only been changed like a week prior. Ooh, check five. Instead of going back to get it, they opted to just use the old mechanism, which is a ratchet and a socket that the silo had on hand for opening the missile's fuel cap. But, critically, the reason they switched to the torque wrench is that the ratchet didn't actually lock the socket. So you know how if you take a wrench and you put a socket on it, it'll it actually positively like attaches. It'll click in. Right. Yeah. It, ha it is able to hold the socket in place. This didn't have that. The socket just floated loose. Mm -hmm. And someone, a second person, had to be on hand to hold the socket as the ratchet was turned to prevent it falling. And then they dropped it. Oops. Yeah. Quote. As Powell used a socket wrench to unscrew the pressure cap, the socket fell off. It struck the platform and bounced. Powell grabbed for it, but missed. Plum watched the nine-pound socket slip through the narrow gap between the platform and the missile, fall about 70 feet, 
hit the thrust mount, and then ricochet off the Titan II. It seemed to happen in slow motion. A moment later, fuel sprayed from a hole in the missile like water from a garden hose. So, shit. Uh oh. I imagine seeing this would be sort of the same, similar to the same mental effect as in Chernobyl when those two guys look down into the burning <laughs> reactor. Also, uh, other Chris, very good job there. You did literally quote those PTS guys over the radio as soon as it happened. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're first, <laughs> the first indication that anything was going wrong to the people in the command center for this missile was, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> the softest oh no in history. Uh oh. <laughs> At the same time, it's also worth mentioning, like, how unlucky this was. Like, this wasn't uncommon. Tools are always falling into nuclear silos. It's something that happens. But normally, they just fall straight to the bottom, and then someone has to go down and get them. This thing, like, ricocheted off of a piece of hardware that was hanging in the air, and it, like, in perfectly just the right way. Like, they had even had examples of tools accidentally hitting the rocket and just denting it. This thing fell in just the right way to get redirected right into the fuel tank and puncture it. Is this just a tool-assisted speedrun to kill a silo? <laughs> I'm thinking about the, um, the nuclear missile doing the I was born with glass bones and paper skin. <laughs> <laughs> it was like all that probability of, of nukes potentially just going off an accident was directed into making the socket go into the exact place to make that fuel leak. The rocket failed to hit an iframe. Those those statistics did not did not account for U.S. airmen. And this is U.S. airmen <laughs> at the same time. Like I, I want I want to make jokes, but I do firmly believe having gone through this story that the the airmen and the PTS crew are not in the wrong. Like, again, this is just bad luck. If the system had been designed properly, this would not have been possible. You know, like if you design a right. bad system that is prone to accidents and then an accident happens, it might not be the accident person's fault. But yeah. Back in the command center, every alarm indicator immediately lit bright red. They indicated a fuel tank leak, an oxidizer leak, and several fires, which were all in, like, to be clear, this is impossible that all three could be happening at the same time. Yeah, all the Half-Life 1 alarms are going off, the scientists are going, <laughs> oh my god, we're doomed! <laughs> <laughs> some guy just, like, jibs in the corner for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Stop! <laughs> just imagine that series of events. You just hear the softest "Oh no!" followed by every single every class alarm going, going off wild. at once. <laughs> Which is another problem: is that the alarms are not working at this time. I want to be clear: there is a fuel leak. Every alarm has gone off, and they are indicating like contradictory emergencies happening all at the same time. Three Stooges syndrome with a <laughs> rocket. <laughs> The command crew ran through every single checklist and procedure they had, and nothing worked. Meanwhile, the alarms are getting more insistent and contradictory, to the point that, like, no one in the command center has any idea what is happening. It's only 30 minutes into the accident that the PTS crew are able to get themselves back to the command center and describe the fact that they have a leak. Quote, Look, guys, the rocket's pissing. The pot rocket had a whoopsie. <laughs> Everyone realized what they were dealing with a major fuel leak, maybe a fire. The Dash 1 didn't have a checklist for this scenario. Now it was time to improvise, to figure out what could be done to save the missile and the warhead and the 10 men in the underground control center. So, they do not have a fucking checklist for what to do if their rocket leaks. Like, no one, no one has thought to train these guys for this. Also, everybody in this room, this is like, this is the US Air Force, there's like a second lieutenant in charge. Everybody here is between the ages of 19 and like 23. Checking another box. Yes. <laughs> no one has any idea what to do. So the first idea was to evacuate the site. So they called that in. Sack shut them down. No permission to evacuate. Stay there. Superiors, check another box. Superiors making dumb decisions. Un uncheck that box and make that box bigger for later. Oh boy. Or add more boxes. Guys, you have to share a room with the angry bottle rocket. You can't leave. <laughs> Meanwhile, the alarms are starting to work their way through SAC's network. Starting in Little Rock Air Force Base, they pull together a team of experts to try and tackle the issue. Like, this is basically the quick response force version of a think tank. All right, gentlemen, <laughs> the rocket is on fire and we have five minutes. What do we do? Sir, how about we put the rocket fire out? You get the hell out of here. <laughs> I also just love the idea of, like, we're able to deploy the RAND Corporation to any spot on the globe within 15 minutes. <coughs> we can, we can, on-site analysis. 
are rapid deployment guys in very thick glasses. <laughs> Just standing there <laughs> looking into the hole with the rocket in it. Well, that's hmm, not yes. good. We're going to need to write a 200 page report about <laughs> this. Get typing. Being like the guy on the ground and getting this like incredibly like it looks very nice, admittedly, like it, there's the embossed cover. <laughs> it's just like just reading through it on page 15 is just like, oh, yeah, maybe we should evacuate. Neat. No, I'm just going to say you get to page 15 and you're just rendered into soup. <laughs> yeah, you don't even finish the executive summary before you get turned into soup. I'm looking, I'm looking up one of the diagrams you have with the, mis the Titan II complex and seeing the emergency eye wash fount uh, fountain <laughs> down like where the thrusters are. It's like, that's a bit generous that you'd even get to that point, isn't it? I was I saw that earlier. I was going to comment on I'm like, it's very generous of them to have included an emergency eye wash fountain at the bottom of the fucking silo. Like, that's where, you know, that's I, where I guess the, if the guy goes. makes it to that point. I guess if the guy makes it to that point. You would it'd be really insulting for him to survive that and then be like <laughs> unable to like find his way to an exit if you live that long. So I guess you may as the well. The entire <laughs> silo around you, like it has flooded with this like corrosive fuel and you are just locked in the shower <laughs> trying to survive. <laughs> you are eye washing desperately in order to like have the water somewhat push back the tide. But crucially, the eye wash station's there and I can't see a way up. I'm assuming there must be a ladder. So you got to wash your like shower eye wash and this, then escape by a ladder out of this like this, this silo, good fucking luck, man. Maybe you're just built different. There are a couple of ladders kind of interspersed around. I absolutely detest that my first thought was an eyewash station for the rocket. <laughs> <laughs> just gently rinse it. There's optics up top on the re-entry vehicle and they're just kind of like rubbing it down. <laughs> it's, it's a Thomas the Tank Engine <laughs> rocket. <laughs> It has a base it's the most on the like top. genocidal warmongering rocket, dude. I want to see, yeah, like they've made planes, they've made cars. I want to see rockets. That would be so cool because it would be space stuff. But then some of the rockets you could have like a because some of the rockets are X missiles. You could have like the cigar chomping Cold War Curtis Lemay general who is now working for NASA and kind of hates himself. I was going to say, if they use star guidance, there's probably a little window on the rocket and it wouldn't need to be washed. <laughs> That's how we check the fuel. You look inside. You just <laughs> maybe shake it a little bit. So they got the big heads around the yeah, table. They got, what are they, they got doing? the big heads around the table. This is the missile potential hazard team. Um, and they've got the commander of the missile wing at Little Rock, the missile head at SAC, and engineers from Martin Marietta, the missile's designer. New problems. None of these guys are experts. <laughs> So not the big heads, it's the very small heads. No, they, they are people who are available. Remember, the Titan II is a very niche and very old weapon. There are 54 of them in existence, and they are only deployed at three bases. The squadron's commander, he has much more experience with Minuteman missiles, which are solid fuel, like they don't line up at all with the Titan. He is only a few months into his job commanding this squadron. Uh-oh. The SAC missile head flat out has no missile experience. He is a general and he flew planes in Korea. Is that checks seven and eight right there? <laughs> Keep the count going. And the actual engineers who designed the missile are no longer at Martin Marietta. They were there like 30 years ago, maybe. The engineers who are now being pulled into this like response team, they are just guys on hand. They have not worked on the Titan. Incredible. It would be like going to NASA and saying like, hey, like, get your Saturn V experts right now. We need them right now. Yeah, somebody get the shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Just wheeling a box in. As information trickled in from the 4-7 command center, the picture started to become more clear, as did the risks. By itself, the Aerozine 50 fuel was not an immediate threat. Like, it's incredibly uh, bad for people, but it is not going to detonate by itself. But as it leaked out into the silo, the temperature would spike. This temperature rise could then cause the oxidizer to expand in its tank, eventually bursting. And when hypergolic fuel meets hypergolic oxidizer, you get an instant explosion. Also, even if the oxidizer tanks didn't burst, there was a very real risk that the loss of pressure in the fuel tanks would cause them to implode, and if they implode, the oxidizer tanks on top would just fall into the lake of fuel and then explode. So many fun ways this could go terrible. I'm interested to learn yeah, which of them yeah, it is. <laughs> what kind of Rube Goldberg mechanism are we going to have for annihilating it this rocket? It ultimately just winds up dropping um, a tank full of nitrogen tetroxide into Aerozine 50. Just like... 
Just the most fucked Beautiful. chain of events. Now, eventually, it was decided to evacuate the command center. They'd lose the ability to monitor the missile, but keeping them there endangered the lives of the 10 crew. The first step was to lock up all of the missile's procedures and checklists. So, like, they've got all these documents out. They're all highly classified to try and stop this problem. If they're going to leave the silo, they need these things to be secured, and they can't take them with. They had a safe, but no one had ever tried putting all the documents in it, and they don't fit. <laughs> So they so they try for a little bit and then they just decide to leave the safe open and run, Trick which is the correct decision. Just them all up and stuffed them in there. That's what I would have <laughs> fucking done. They can court martial me later. I'm gonna live. I don't give a fuck about your creases. I'm leaving. To give this next quote some context, they try and leave through blast door eight. So they're in the launch control center. They tr their first plan is to go to the stairs and then is that like the main entrance? Yeah, leave the way they came in. Run towards the missile silo. Hey, sometimes you gotta get closer to it before you can get further away. And this does not work. Quote, Fuller, Lester, and Powell stood beside Blast Door 8. Powell kept his hand on the button. He unlocked the door and Lester slowly cracked it open. The blast lock was filled with a white hazy mist that smelled like fuel and smoke. Lester slammed the door and Powell locked it. So fuel has now fully leaked out of the silo and is now filling the entire second, like, building of this launch don't facility. Like that. And it's not long before it's going to start, like, getting through the vents into the launch center. So they can't go out that way. They cannot go through the flesh-eating fuel. Thankfully, the command center has another escape route. A tunnel so small you have to crawl through it that leads to a ladder to the surface. And you said this crew was 10? Like, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling yes. now because, like, Minutemen silos, like, the pods are just, like, it's just, like, you have the capsule commander and the deputy capsule commander, and that's it. Imagine a 10-man ICBM crew. I believe this would have been eight normally, but you have right. the two uh, PST guys, or sorry, PTS guys mixed in. Still, yeah, a lot of people, who, and this needs to be, like, this. they're on alert 24-7. There are beds, like, you can live in this place, and some people do. So this, this uh, ladder, this ladder in this tiny tunnel, there are supposed to be lights in the shaft to kind of, like, guide people, uh, but they don't work. So the entire crew, wearing either their Refco spacesuits or gas masks has to climb five stories up a ladder in pitch darkness while unable oh, to breathe. Oh, I hate that. Beautiful. We're just it's, getting... Like, if you're claustrophobic, this is the worst thing ever. Like, you have people above you and below you kind of, like, locking you in. Just, like, I, you're just starting to go, you know what, maybe I'll take my chances with the flesh-eating haze. <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna go talk to the rocket. It's gonna, it's gonna let us go. <laughs> Everything will be fine. Just let me out there. I'll reason with it. So, all of them do manage to make it out, and they regroup outside of the missile site's fence. Um, and there's kind of like a road leading down to the main Arkansas road. The main Arkansas, the one road in Arkansas. Yeah, fuck. the one road. Bill Clinton Road. That rules them all. Also, these guys in interviews, all of them kind of realize, like, they're trying to run for their lives. And a couple of guys realize, like, hey, wait a second. We just abandoned a nuclear warhead. A nuclear warhead is now unsupervised and sitting alone by itself because of us. Is this a bad thing? It wants to explode and you're just going to let it. <laughs> Now, as this accident is unfolding, news unofficially starts to trickle out. There was a problem at a missile silo in Arkansas. That's kind of like the bare bones, like some reporters get wind of that. Some people with a bit more access evacuated their families. Meanwhile, a few radio and news people showed up at the site's access road where guards, uh, where guards tried to shoo them away, denied that there were any problems, and claimed the missile didn't even have a warhead. That's stupid. Which, honestly, like, it would have been more effective if they'd told them the truth. Like, if you want to get rid of them, say, there is a nuclear missile that is going to explode. Why are you here? It to annihilate itself. It is about 500 feet that way. Now, more PTS crews were scrambled to Site-47 to help. They found the group of command center staff and realized that no one, anywhere, had any idea what was going on in that silo. With no one in the command center to read the gauges, the Air Force was now blind as a 9 megaton warhead inched closer to potential detonation. And I will also say, as we kind of finish this out, that this is where the story gets a little, this is where the story gets less uh -oh. fun. This is the story of like disaster mitigation. Um, one of the PTS men, Sergeant Jeff Kennedy, decided to go against orders by entering the command center himself. He also broke the biggest rule of the PTS crews. Anytime you did anything, you needed someone with you as backup. Acting alone, Kennedy climbed down the emergency ladder and into the command center, again in a refco. And then he left, because what he found was probably the most terrifying set of numbers you could find. 
The pressure on the leaking tank was now negative. 14,000 gallons, or 53,000 liters, of Aerozine 50 fuel had leaked into the silo. Jesus. This is like beyond worst case scenario. Huh. Those, those fuel tanks, we don't know exactly what happened, but it's highly likely that the fuel tanks, by having such low pressure, did crumple and dump the oxidizer. Um, so Kennedy ran back out to the command crew, and they relayed their findings to SAC. 15 minutes passed, and they got a response, and SAC reprimanded Kennedy and declared that no one was to do anything unless ordered by them. And no further message followed for a little bit. Fucking Air Force, man. <laughs> it's like hey this missile this missile is about to explode they're all fucked in their own way uh, but like I, I, they all kind of take uh, turns at being the most fucked and i feel i feel i feel like the air force and the navy are always kind of in competition for who's the most fucked out of all of them and i think in this case like at this point the air force was the most fucked this story is going to get sad for a little bit but don't worry it's going to end angry and it's going to end angry at how fucked the air force is i know how to do that I mean, we're sitting at a beautiful nine checks right now. We're hitting double digits <laughs> soon. Oh, very soon. So back in the missile potential hazard team, Martin Marietta officials were recommending a complete evacuation and basically just letting the accident play out. The missile would probably explode instead of burn, and that was unlikely to actually trigger the warhead. So no problem. The Air Force did not agree. While the PTS crew gathered and waited just outside the fence, they finally got new orders. Teams of volunteers would be sent into the silo to try and open a valve and drain the tank, preventing an implosion. So we like there are a lot of things as I was reading this that kind of reminded me of Chernobyl. Uh, and we have now gotten to the volunteers who are fully expected to die who need to turn a valve. Yeah, some serious parallels here. The stakes may not be the same, but uh, it, 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 it sure does rhyme. The first crew to try entering made it most of the way in before having to turn back. See, to prevent sparks, the command crew shut off all the power before leaving, which means if they're going to get to the silo, the PTS men have to open each blast door by manually pumping the hydraulics. And this first crew, they only have 30 minutes of air because their suits have, they, they show up, they have been using their suits throughout the day, they don't have oxygen canisters. Also, while they are working, they measure fuel concentrations in the air higher than 250 parts per million which is enough to eat through the suits and poison the men inside. In another Chernobyl parallel, we don't actually know how high the concentrations were because the sensors maxed out at 250 parts per million. Not great, not terrible. Or all really uh, terrible, probably worse. <laughs> really? <laughs> it, I mean, it can only be worse. So, like we said, the first crew had to turn back because they ran out of air in their tanks. The second crew was Sergeant Jeff Kennedy, who was the guy who ran in by himself before, and senior airman David Livingston. The two were able to get the blast door fully opened, but fuel concentrations are so high they can't even risk entering. Kennedy described not being able to see the walls around him or even his hand through the hydrazine fog. Jesus. Uh, how did he even, just imagine that, and obviously like, he was able to make it out to tell us, but like, how, did you, if you can't even see your hand, how the fuck are you getting out of there? Yeah, well, I, I, like, they kind of walked in a little bit and then turned around yeah, wisely. Yeah, wisely. <laughs> Just, I can't see my hand in front of my face. Thank you, Hydrazine. Yeah, another thing is that this fuel is not supposed to be out. Like, they're entering the kind of... They're entering the blast door area. They are not at the silo yet. This fuel is so concentrated, and they're not even at the most concentrated part. The silo by this time is just, like, packed with the stuff. It's a fuel air bomb. It really is. As they regrouped topside, they got a final order over the radio. If they couldn't open the valve, someone was going to have to go back in and turn on an exhaust fan. If they could vent the fuel vapors out of the silo, that could at least mitigate an explosion. There'd be a plume of it, but that was better than a bomb. Livingston volunteered and went back into the silo alone. Quote, Livingston switched on the fan and came back up the stairs. He was a foot or two behind Kennedy when the Titan II exploded. They were in there when it exploded? They were, they were like just at the door. They were just on their way out when it exploded. They're at what, door eight? Um, this would have been, let me check. They're like at the hatch. They are up the stairs and out. Gotcha. So they're at the top side hatch. Yeah, they are. They okay. are right at the top side hatch. Kennedy is outside. Livingston is like on the second last step out. And then the rocket explodes. Back at the road, everyone, airmen, police and reporters tried to drive away as quickly as possible. 
They'd seen an explosion, and everyone feared that it was nuclear. Even if the warhead hadn't detonated, it was a very real fear that it could have cracked open and spread contamination into the air. Right, dirty bomb. Yeah. Where the PTS crew was posted up outside the site, they got flash burns, oxidizer inhalation, and were pelted with debris blown out of the silo. One man, Greg Devlin, got all three. He was burned in the explosion, had his ankles smashed by thrown debris as he tried to run, and inhaled fumes as he was hauled away. In all, 21 men, mostly from the PTS crew, were wounded in the explosion. Both Kennedy and Livingston managed to survive the blast. <sighs> Kennedy was blown clear, broke his leg, and wound up tangled in the site's fence. As he hauled himself back toward their truck, he heard Livingston screaming for help somewhere in the crater that used to be Site-47. Kennedy got to the truck, found the radio, and called for help. Despite not having any gear or even gas masks at this point, teams of PTS men went back to Site-47 to drag Kennedy and Livingston to safety. As they shuffled the wounded up and down the site's road, they had to veer around a large, burnt, cylindrical object that landed just off the road about 200 yards from the silo. The missile's 9 megaton nuclear warhead. Just go around, it'll be fine. Don't look at it. Don't look at it too hard. Just do not perceive it. Do not perceive the <laughs> do warhead. Not, do, do not upset the warhead. Do not make eye contact with the warhead. It will take this as a threat. <laughs> but can we briefly go to a... You said Kennedy survived, right? Yes. Kennedy and Livingston both survived yeah, the blast. Yeah, go to slide six. That's his helmet. That is Jesus his helmet. That is Kennedy's Christ, man. helmet. If he was a cat, he spent like eight of his nine lives. And then he gets oxidizer poisoning, which is very bad for you. It's usually bad when your helmet has a hole in it. They, they also managed to get Livingston out. He is, he's described as like very wounded. He has, um, the explosion has like driven concrete shards into his guts. Christ. Oh. All of the wounded were rushed to a hospital where senior airman Livingston died of his wounds. Oh. Aftermath. Sheriff, has the Air Force told you very much? They haven't told me a darn thing. Does that make you mad? Yes, it does. I need to know what's going on so I'll know how to handle the situation. And uh, if they want to tell me in confidence, that'd be great. At least I'd know how to, you know, when and how to evacuate the people. And if all of that was sad, get ready for angry. All right, I'm ready for angry. I can do angry. All right, pivoting. The cover-up attempts started almost immediately. Of course. <laughs> Anytime anyone asked, from media to even Vice President Mondale, Jimmy Carter's vice president asked the Air Force directly, is there a nuke on this rocket? The Air Force said, we can neither confirm nor deny. Is there a warhead on the site? I cannot confirm or deny. They also could neither confirm nor deny that there had been an accident at all, that anyone had been hurt, that anyone had been killed, or that anything had happened on September 18th. Imagine the gall to lie to your boss's face. Yes. With a non-committal statement of, yeah. I can't confirm or deny that. To the vice president. Like, 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 it's one thing that, like, it's not great, but it's one thing when you're saying that to just some rando or some, like, reporter from, like, the, like, the, like, Des Moines Daily Bugle or something like that. But, yeah. like, you're saying to the vice president, like, we, we can neither confirm nor, nor deny. Confirm, no, confirm nor deny sucking my dick from the back, dude. Yeah, like, like act actively just telling the executive branch, uh, that is classified and you are not cleared for that information, Mr. President. <laughs> to prevent them talking to the media, the Air Force pushed for all of the wounded PTS crew to be transferred back to base within two days of the accident. A lot of them while they're still, like, heavily wounded and on death's door. In those two days, the Air Force had not sent anyone to talk to the PTS crew who, like, a lot of these guys describe, like, they think that there has been a nuclear explosion. They think, like, the guy who dropped the socket in interviews continues to blame himself for both Livingston's death and the explosion overall. And when these guys are sent back to Little Rock Air Force Base, they are immediately punished and, like, swept under the rug. Greg Devlin, the guy who tried to enter the silo before Kennedy, and the guy who had his legs smashed in the explosion, he was relegated to selling hot dogs at the canteen a job normally given to fuck-ups and people releasing with, like, dishonorable discharges. And fuck the Air Force. <laughs> Kennedy got an official letter of reprimand for going into the command center alone and acting against orders. Though Air Force regulations, like, he gets a court-martial for this, Air Force regulations allowed for actions like this in an emergency. They explicitly say you can ignore the two-man rule in an emergency. They did not give that to Kennedy. They deliberately punished him for this. When Kennedy and Devlin went for treatment, 
they all like whenever they went to an Air Force hospital for treatment, they were also deliberately placed in the psych ward for like chemical burns. What the fuck is what? that? <laughs> yeah. Devlin, Kennedy, and many others on the PTS team broke their silence and talked to the media. I would highly recommend, it'll be linked below, I would recommend watching the PBS documentary Command and Control that goes over this accident because it has interviews with all of these figures. It has the new interviews nowadays, but it also has the old news interviews back then. And these guys, like, they're all like 21, 22. These guys are not fire and brimstone. They're not screaming at the Air Force. They are confused. And they are trying to understand why they're being punished for doing the right thing. I worked three and a half years, did a good job for three and a half years. And then I wound up hurt from this explosion. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they don't want you anymore. You know, you, you're not any good to them because you're crippled or injured for a while. So now I don't know, you know, I don't know if, you know, I don't know about the system. I don't know if I'm going to be railroaded out or... You know, I don't know where I stand, really. So temporarily, talking to the news makes things a lot worse. These guys get punished. Um, they get disrespected. But it did put pressure on the Air Force to properly recognize the people who had tried to stop a nuclear disaster. Quote, A few months later, at a ceremony in Little Rock, both men were given an Airman's Medal of Heroism, the highest peacetime honor that the Air Force can bestow. Kennedy didn't want to accept it. But his local congressman in Maine, David Emery, said that if he took the medal, the Air Force would allow him to leave. Kennedy was given the medal by Vern Orr, the Secretary of the Air Force, in a room full of reporters. Airmen's medals were also given to Rex Huckle, Don Green, Jimmy Roberts, and David, and David Livingston's father. So all of these guys know that this is a PTS stunt, and they all hate it. Also, there was a lot of politics of who had been included and who had been excluded. Uh, one of the PTS guys, Jim Sandacre, was completely excluded from any of this, never given any recognition, despite going back into the fuel-filled chamber twice through the whole disaster. But he had talked to the news, and so he was a pariah. So the Air Force denied everything. I love how, like, they, and I love, I mean, I hate, like, the fact that they're giving these guys medals for heroism when before the, the pressure came from the news, like, they're basically recognizing the fact that, yeah, what these guys did was actually pretty heroic, but before they were ready to punish them, basically just because, well, we need to make sure that somebody's punished for this. Uh, even, so even though yeah. these guys actually did the right thing, we're just going to come down hard on them because we need scapegoats and we're only going to ease up on it because someone's going to be mean to us on the news. Man, fuck you. And uh, the biggest scapegoat of them is Powell, who was the guy who originally dropped the socket and... The Air Force's entire tack at this time is that it's human error, and the only human error is Powell because he dropped the socket. And that is that, and we don't need to investigate or do anything further. And, like, yeah, he dropped the socket, but tools get dropped all the time. It was a freak accident, and the system was designed in such a way that, like, yeah, it, it's, I th it's so much more than human error at the end of the day. Like, again, they did not have a procedure for a fuel leak. No one had thought to write that. It's a systemic failure. Um, if you make an accident-prone system and then an accident happens, it's not the, necessarily the fault of the person who caused the accident. So within a few days of the ceremony, many of the PTS men like Kennedy and Devlin quit the Air Force. Though there were several attempts to sue Martin Marietta for their unsafe missile and the Air Force for their unsafe handling of that missile, most of it came to nothing or very little. It also highlighted how hard the Air Force would fight to deny these men any kind of compensation on and also medical coverage. Quote, During that case, the Surgeon General of the Air Force had denied that inhaling oxidizer was bad for you, claiming that it was, quote, a substance no more dangerous than smog. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm again, gonna fucking again, get put on a watch list here. if I speak. Again, like, a lot of these guys have ongoing health problems to this day, the ones that are still alive, because they inhaled nitrogen tetroxide, which causes, like, so much damage to your lungs. I mean, what do you mean? They're still alive. <laughs> and like a lot of these guys wind up having to settle whenever they bring cases. Greg Devlin winds up having to settle with Martin Marietta and he winds up like his net gain after all of that is like $6,000. As for the warhead, it was recovered and secretly trucked out of the site. Because the Air Force continued to deny that the missile was nuclear, they had to use all kinds of tactics like sending out decoy trucks to try and fool the media. 
The casing wasn't cracked and the warhead hadn't released fallout into the area. There also wasn't a risk of accidental detonation because, thankfully, the explosion had ripped the warhead's power supply off in just such a way that the weapon could never be triggered again. So like the nuclear weapon experts who look at this, they tell the Air Force, hey, this is an incredible stroke of luck. We cannot count on this happening again. And the Air Force then goes to the media and says, like, good news, all of our weapons are accident proof forever. There is no way anything could have gone wrong, so stop worrying. Oh my god, I'm gonna commit a I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> commit a fucking crime. It keeps getting it just keeps getting These worse. These guys just can't stop just fucking being the worst people in existence. I know. And it's again just like the experts are telling you, like, hey, this was an incredibly close call. It's only because the like the explosion damaged the warhead in such a way that it could de never detonate. But by the same token, it could have damaged it in such a way that it did. And the Air Force is just like 100 percent accident proof forever. Got it. The blinders are just 100 percent. I would say like, you know, like the Air Force in general at this time and in general has problems, but but also like. The missile community in general is just completely fucked too, and even more fucked today. <laughs> oh yeah. Despite the accident and rising public concern, the Titan II would stay in service for another seven goddamn years. Their decommissioning was announced in late 1981, but it was a slow process for a couple of reasons. First, it was expensive. So, investigations into the Damascus incident, this explosion, they had come up with several modifications to the Titan II silos that could prevent future accidents. The Air Force played these two forces against each other, the need to decommission these old Titan IIs with the need to upgrade them while they're still around. And they, they had this balance, this back and forth, this convenience, and they used this to keep their precious little toys as long as possible. The decommissioning had to be delayed so that they had time to add the safety features. And, at the same time, some of those safety features were completely denied, things like security cameras or vapor detectors, because why would you upgrade a decommissioned missile? I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised they even, like, said they would add <laughs> features, because, like, well, clearly this was all human error, so, I mean, like, there's no reason for us to have to change anything. They, they presented it as being features to prevent human error, and, like, continuing to throw those PTS guys under the bus. Hey guys, I just got a flash flood warning, so if I suddenly go quiet, you know what's up. Mm. Hope you don't get flash flooded. <laughs> that probably should have changed my mood more, but I'm sad and angry. The U.S. Air Force is flooding my house in retaliation They're for this They're flooding you with the, with, the, with the rocket fuel for, for bringing up their <laughs> past failures. Time to go in the, the, time to go in the pitch black uh, hatch and climb up the ladder. Now, the other reason is that in 1981... Ronald Reagan took office uh, and started the largest nuclear buildup in American history. So under those circumstances, no one was eager to get rid of a nuclear weapon, let alone America's biggest bomb. Like it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I hate it more. I told you we were going to have so many honorary hosts on this episode. It's just a rogues gallery. This missile only makes it to 1980 because of Henry. And then Ronnie is just like, give it another seven years. Well, I think also at this point, they're trying to, I, I, I think, I can't remember, I think Peacekeeper was supposed to be the notional replacement for this. If I yeah, I, yes, that sounds right. That, that was something that was on right. the way. And then we didn't get to it as much, but also there's an interview of uh, a certain Arkansas governor back then, a certain Bill Clinton talking about how perfectly safe the Titan II was now. Oh God, yeah, he was, he was governor when this happened, wasn't he? Hell yeah, he was. He went out there with the Air Force and was basically just like, yeah, there's no reason to worry. Uh, I have been reliably informed that the weapon is 100% accident proof Look, they're now. they're telling me that this thing is, is the greatest <laughs> thing we've ever seen. And, you know, personally, I, I think, uh, I think the Humes are probably good for you. I think they'd be good for America. I think we should all want to <laughs> inhale the fumes. I think they would bring us closer together as a nation. And that's the kind of that's the kind of thing we need in this trying time. Uh, thanks. I hate it. Still, in the end, the final Titan II was taken off alert and removed from its silo in 1987 after about 25 years in service. And again, unlike the Minuteman, they were not upgraded. The same missile was sitting in that silo for 25 years. It's like the guy in the basement who's like in the mailroom at a company who just will not retire. <laughs> you can't get rid of him. Also, I did say that that same missile from the original fire would come back. This is something that I didn't know how to really tie it in with the story. It's more of just a grim observation. That missile we talked about, 
serial number 620006, the one that was involved in the fire in 1965 that killed 53 men, that is the exact same missile that exploded You're in Damascus. Kidding. <laughs> There it is. It has it's thirsted for blood and it, it wasn't has done the yet. taste for human blood. That makes this missile the only single ICBM in history that has killed on two separate occasions and over 15 years. It's a recidivist, a serial offender. It is also worth mentioning that it only killed Americans, <laughs> as is as is the case of, uh, I guess, at the end of the day, literally every single nuclear ICBM. Incredible. I hate it. I hate this so much. I hate everything about this. I was trying to workshop the, you were, you were like, and that missile, and I'm like, what, well, grew up to be uh, George W. Bush yeah. or something. Like, <laughs> I, I'm trying to workshop it. I can't figure out what would have been a funny thing uh, to say. <laughs> now, I do, ha I do get to kind of tie this back to space because prior to the Saturn V, every single launch vehicle that America fielded, and the same was true of the Soviets even up to today with the Soyuz, all of those rockets that launched satellites were derived from military missiles. And while the Titan II was an odd duck of a weapon, obsolete even in the 60s and only kept around to try and trade it off with the Soviets, it had a second life as a spacecraft launcher. If you've ever seen pictures of NASA Gemini launches, you've probably seen a modified Titan II, the GLV, or Gemini Launch Vehicle. All 12 Gemini launches flew with the GLV, and they flew successfully. The GLV would then later be modified into the Titan 3 and 4 series of launch vehicles, which served government and civilian launches from 1964 all the way to their final launch in 2005, making it a horribly, I guess horrible in every sense of the word as a weapon. It was unreliable to its crews and it was unreliable as something that could kill the enemy, but reportedly a pretty good satellite launcher and reportedly pretty good for, you know, manned space exploration. Yeah, how could one... I rocket be such a terrible ICBM, but such a pretty decent space launch vehicle. I mean, the exact uh, same thing can be said of the R-7. The first ICBM in history is the R-7 Semyorka, and it is the rocket that is still used today. It was used all through the Soviet Union. It's still used by Roscosmos to launch uh, spacecraft, to launch satellites, to launch people. And it was also a horrible weapon. So... It's it's the different needs. It's the different uses. Uh, so solid fuel is the best. Minute Minuteman for life. Those ones are not going to melt you. God. I, I suppose I suppose NASA also like had had less of a Rube Goldberg way of launching it because they didn't have to worry about <laughs> elevators and silos. They could just put it out on a launch pad, like yeah, and just let it yeah, rip. Just leave it alone. Yeah. So everyone, that is the story of the Damascus incident, the nuclear spud gun, and the brave people who tried to stop it and got fucked over for their troubles. How do we all feel? Angry. I felt Very the angry. entire range of, of human emotion and then settled on fuck the Air Force. Hell yeah. I realized, thinking about it, that it's like, how do you even reprimand the guys at the top that develop the system that is inherently flawed and then try to blame it on their subordinates? It's like, okay, well, I mean, clearly they're not beholden to anyone except themselves already because they're like upper class elitism because, I mean, you don't, you don't end up in a position that high in, in any military branch unless you have connections, right? And yeah, you got to be like a politician to, to get that to that point, you know, like there's like a certain, yeah. You can't sit them down in a room and reprimand them unless you're like maybe the president of the United States. I mean, as we saw, that didn't work. Are they even going to listen to the president of the United States? They might, the president might be their boss, but they might not like them. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, you're a dumb idiot and you're wrong. I mean, the president can technically fire whoever they want to, but it's a question of like, do you want the political back? Like, like all it's all it's possible to do all this. I mean, like, like, like Truman fired MacArthur and all that. But like, it's a question of how badly do you want the fight? Like, or, or like, are you worried? Is, are you worried? Is it going to make you look bad? Like, like, do you want to think like, well, if I, you know, if, am I going to look like I'm the president who's like blaming these guys or like, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of yeah. political considerations. It's not impossible to hold people account, but it's more effort and and risk than most politicians are probably willing to take be the president in the debrief room to beat them all with a belt <laughs> uh, i want you to get yeah, everyone just in here who's go. involved in, in this missile blowing up i'm gonna get my belt i'm gonna whoop their ass just tie them into the uh, james bond wicker chair <laughs> that doesn't have a bottom on it oh. jesus so uh on that <laughs> note <laughs> everyone on the wicker that, chair that has life. been a podcast 
KD, thank you so much for coming on uh, this show and talking to us about the uh, Damascus incident. We don't have a massive audience, but do you have anything you'd like to plug? Anything uh, we can point them towards? First of all, thank you for having me on. I know it ended on kind of a, you know, angry, sour note, but this was this was an absolute delight to be on. Uh, and, you know, I don't really have much to plug. Like I have, you know, you can find me on Twitter and Blue Sky at uh, at war underscore takes and at Komodo Dad. You can go to the war takes. You want to hear me, you know, ship post ramble, do attempts at analysis involving war and so on. And Komodo Dad, if you just want to see me just post furry crap. So you got you got two flavors there. <laughs> And audience, thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to hear more of this, consider supporting us on Patreon. Signing up at any tier gets you access to a uh, monthly bonus episode, and uh, signing up at elevated tiers gets you access to even more stuff, like mini-sodes. But yeah, KD, thank you for coming on. Audience, thank you for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you to everyone who have signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons. Our cyborg cats, our boss, Charlie, Ellie M, Jorg2, the boat that melts you instantly, June, Lupe G, Matt, Noah, Spectre Cohen, Tortilla Baron, and Vivek D. Our space dogs are a union thug, that guy is best guy, angry old man, yada yada, band user, Ben L, Boomzilla, Brandon M, Chainsaw Snuggling, Captain Lag, Daddy Bongo, Dan A, Double Time, Fractal Moonlight, Furious Luddite, James A, James C, John C, Korolev's Condiments, Lane of the Wired, Lenswipe, Michael G, Nick S, Oliver, Sean H, Sensual Kazoo, Sean P, Sophie L, Sparks, Thomas M, Tim P, Trash Do, Virosh T, Will W, Wingsmith, Zaxum, and Zim. Albert Count, 64. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. FTL intro and outro themes were provided by DJ Danarchy.